Take your Bible. I have this up on the screen, but I want you to open your Bible up. Um, Leviticus 5. If you'll turn there very quickly, uh, and then maybe just kind of put your Bible bookmarker in that place and leave it there. And I'm going to run through some other verses for you uh, very quickly. <clears throat> Again, it's good to have everybody with us. Good to have you folks online. And um, pray, for, uh, pray for me. There's just a lot of things coming up. Um, essentially three different conferences in the month of March. March, I'll be in Pea Ridge and three nights there. And then um, they, I'll be speaking a total of five times in Fargo. And then three more nights in uh, Moorhead, Minnesota. No, not Moorhead, uh, Northfield, Minnesota. And um, so there's a lot of work to put into that and a lot of things to get ready for, plus the things that I do here. So I just ask that you pray for me uh, in that and pray that God will give me fresh oil. God will uh, give me the, the right things to say to the people that we minister to. And, um, and I, I'm going to ask you again to pray for, I, I went to see my doctor the other day and this condition that I have, it, it's one of the leftovers from being electrocuted back in 2006. And my face will just, it'll just stay red and it'll be hot almost all the time. And the medicine I was taking for that uh, would calm that down. And um, on days that I knew, I was supposed to take one in the morning, one at night, but on days that I know it's going to be preaching like at night, I would save the morning dose until the evening and take both at the same time. And that kept me from really just going into just furious sweats while I'm preaching. And when they changed me over to the generic version of that, sometimes the generics work and sometimes they ain't no good. And in this case, it ain't no good. And it doesn't do a thing, doesn't help me at all. So when I asked to go back on the name brand, they said, sure, no problem. It's 400, how much was it? Four? 471? That's, um, that's higher than what I thought it was. So, and that's just for one month. And um, so just pray that we'll be able to work that out with the insurance. I don't know if they're going to budge on it. I have no idea. So just uh, help me pray about that, all right? You're in Leviticus 5. Are you there? Say amen. All right. Do you believe the Bible? All right. I've been preaching now uh, the last few Sundays on lies, lying, liars, the kind of lies that people tell, why they tell lies, where lies come from. By and large, the idea from the scripture is that people lie to cover up the truth. And it's usually covering up the truth about themselves. And I don't believe there's any salvation for somebody like that. I think if you want, I think if you want to go to heaven, and, and really what everything that I preach on boils down to this one thing, whether or not you spend eternity in heaven or hell. If I preach on political things every now and then, which I, I'll do. If I preach on Bible prophecy every now and then, which I'll do. Or if I preach on marriage and things related to marriage, raising family, if I, whatever it is I preach on. It all boils down to there is nothing more important to you personally than whether or not you're going to heaven when you die. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. I, I told this man that I've had the, the blessing of pastoring some of the people that, that, that to me they were my heroes. I looked up to these people. I admired these people. They were the ones who helped shape me as a young man growing up in this church. But several of them I've laid to rest. And in almost every case, I knew where they were. That was a comfort to me because I knew that where they were was a much better life than where we are right here, right now. We've all lost people out of our families. We've all lost some very dear, precious family members. We've lost friends. And in some cases, we know they're in heaven. But in some cases, we just, we wonder. 
Where are they right now? And if they didn't get this one, this one decision right, the sad, unfortunate realization is they are in hell, which we still believe in and still preach it. There has got the, even man's laws have to have a punishment for breaking those laws. Even man's laws are that way. God's laws are no different and God's laws matter. You could be sentenced to life in prison or even sentenced to death but die and go to heaven there was a young man when I was out in college out in Oklahoma there was a young man 16 years old he was the youngest man on death row his name was Sean Sellers and he had got into some occult things he got into some occult practices devils just all over him he killed his mother killed his stepfather went to a convenience store killed the convenience they found him guilty of first degree murder. They sentenced him to death while he's in prison. A minister goes to him, leads him to the Lord. He gets saved. And he was able to do a couple of interviews uh, from his prison cell. And he was pleading, pleading people, don't get into these occult things. Don't start following the devil. Turn away from these things because they're going to take my life. Now he knew he wasn't asking for a pardon. He wasn't asking for the governor to, uh, to uh, what does they call it, clemency, where he didn't have to be put on death row. He knew that he deserved to die for the sins that he committed down here. But he said, I know that when I close my eyes this last time in this earth, I know where I'll be in eternity. And I wouldn't mind dying that way, amen. I want to know where I'm going when I die. So it comes down to really... Where are you going to spend eternity? And nothing else matters. Nothing else is as important as that. So when, if, if uh, let's say you came to me and you said, uh, Pastor, you know, I, I, I've been, uh, been reading the Bible, been thinking about it, and I don't think I've ever been saved. And uh, Pastor, I, I think I'm ready to give my life to the Lord. I'll never forget old Buster Montgomery, 77 years old, World War II veteran, was out at Pearl Harbor, did submarine duty. Sat on those submarines, 17 year old boy. He, he lied to get into the army, got into the Navy. Sitting on that submarine with those Japanese mines going off, bombs going off everywhere in that submarine. He just figured just at any moment that submarine was going to bust in half and it's going to kill him instantly. And he didn't, he never really, I don't know if he thought about it then, but here he is, 77 years old. His wife, him and his wife are coming to church and he comes to me and he says, I want to talk to you. So I went to his house that Saturday and we drank tea and we talked about World War II and submarines and everything else. And then he said, Pastor, I got to know something. I need to know whether or not I'm going to heaven when I die. 77 years old. And he died not too, not too long after that. But he's in heaven. My brother-in-law, trespass after trespass, sin after sin that he filled his life with. And yet he comes to me before, a week before he died. And I, he had already been saved. I knew that. I saw that months ago. But he came to me and said, Mike, I just want to make sure I know I'm going to heaven when I die. I said, Steve, you are. I prayed with him in my office. And that Friday he closed his eyes and his last breath left him. And he's in glory right now because of that. So if somebody comes to me and says, I, 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 I just want to know that I'm saved. Well, we take him down what we call the Romans road. So take your Bible, open the book of Romans. I'm going to move through this real fast and get, this is sort of the precursor to the message, but I want to get to this and move on. Romans 3, 23. In fact, who knows these by hand? Who know, by memory, raise your hand. You know them by memory. Romans 3, 23. For, say it with me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I've sinned, you've sinned, he sinned, she sinned. Everybody's sinned. Then Romans 6, 23. The Bible says this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. As a consequence of our sins, we deserve hell, we deserve death in the lake of fire. Jesus, Now that's not death like you're thinking of. Jesus called it in Matthew 25, he called it everlasting punishment. That doesn't sound like to me you're unconscious. Sounds like to me you know that you're there. The rich man knew where he was and knew why he was there. And then Romans 10, turn there. 
Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in heart, thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Right after that, I'll throw in which you shouldn't have turned there. Say that with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Somebody say amen. amen. The next verse after that says, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Now take your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Let's see if I can find it. Romans 2. Yeah, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a free gift, not given to anybody who thinks they deserve it, because none of us do. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. Then, always leaving with this last verse, turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And then here I want you to underline this verse. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Now I've been preaching on that lie. That lie that you tell yourself. You tell yourself, what I'm doing is not wrong. Or what I'm doing is justified. Or I don't believe God would condemn me for this. That's a lie. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You're not going to heaven. You're not. So verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you believe the Bible this morning? Say amen. amen. I, could, I could close the service right here and right now and say, I've preached to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has provided a way for each and every one of us wicked, hell-deserving, low-down, dirty, rotten sinners. And all of us, all of us are that way. Ed, I said that growing up here in this church, I revered these people, these adults. Brother and Sister Waymire, Sister Bernice, countless others. I thought these were the greatest people in the world. And I had somehow convinced myself that they never did any wrong. And then I grew up. And I became adult. And I realized that there was a reason why Brother Waymire was in this church. He was a sinner. Brother Waymire, I, I didn't, there was things about him that I didn't know until his funeral was preached. Brother Waymire, you struggle with cigarettes. I, you could have slapped me in the head with a fish. I never could see James Waymire with an old cigarette in his mouth. And cursed, man, he cursed. But when God saved him, God began the process, didn't happen overnight, God began the process of taking all that out of his life. But it turned from sin to confession of sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I preached this last week, not going to hit on it again, but I am going to mention whatever you hold back from confessing to God, you just might as well not tell Him anything. Because with God, 
You either confess it all or don't waste God's time. Can you go to heaven believing that half the things that you do wrong are wrong while the other half are okay, but they're still wrong? Can you go to heaven that way? The answer is no. So now we're, we're shifting over from people living a lie and one of the other things that I found out growing up in, a, and I could have, it could have been this church I grew up in or any church I grew up in, but one of the other things I found out was that some people came to church and they lied through their teeth. They were no more saved than this carpet is saved. What happened to my, what happened to my screen? I'm going to have to fix that. So you got your Bible there in Leviticus? Hang on. Let me see what happened here. Ta-da! Got it back. Amen. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1. And if a soul sin, and hear the voice of swearing, and is a witness, whether he has seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Or if a soul touch any, any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of an unclean cattle or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he shall be unclean and guilty. Or if he touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be, that a man shall be defiled withal, and it be hid from him. When he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. Verse 4, or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, do you know Colonel Harlan Sanders became a born-again, Bible-believing Christian late in life? Years ago, I had heard outtakes of commercials that he had done, and they were like one of these blooper things, and they would record Colonel Sanders trying to do like a radio commercial, and they had to bleep out 90% of what he said because he'd get mad and just start cursing. And he got on a Christian TV show years ago, back in the 80s. I remember, you can watch this on YouTube. And he said, I used to have a terrible problem with swearing. He said, I just swear and curse. He said, I'd get mad and I'd just curse and curse and curse. And he said, I just swear all the time. And he said, it was bad. And I'm going, yeah, I've heard you. It was bad. But he said... I went to a, 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 a church, a preacher preached the gospel, and he said, I got saved, and he gave my life to the Lord, and he said, God, I, I, won't, I won't try to live this unless you change my mouth. And he said, God took the cursing right out of my mouth, and he said, bless God, I don't curse no more. Man, I didn't know that. But the Bible says, back in verse 4 again, if a soul swear pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, Whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. Verse 5 now is where I'm going with this. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing. And basically what the Bible's telling you, we'll go to the Lord in prayer, what the Bible's telling you, it's your sin and when you realize that you've done wrong, it is commanded of you by God to confess that sin. Commanded by God. Now there's two ways to handle this. You can either wait until God makes you confess or you can just go ahead and confess because it's the right thing to do. Which is better? To do it because it's the right thing to do. Because how will God make you confess? He'll whip you until you confess. 
That's what he'll do. God is our father, and he'll take a rod of chastisement against us, and we'll confess. That's God's way of doing it. That was my mom's way of doing it. That was probably your mama's way of doing it, or your daddy's way of doing it. But it's better to just go ahead and confess it. Let's pray. Father, your word says that you desire truth in our inward parts. And Father, while we have this, this notion in our minds that if we make everything look good on the outside, then, then everything's good. Father, that's not true. We can dress up, pretty up, make ourselves smell good, cover up, hide all sorts of sins and transgressions. But the truth be told, we are lying and we're guilty of sins. And there's no way out of it. So Father, teach us this morning about confession. Teach us, dear God, how to have an attitude that is willing to confess and to get things right. And Father, I'm thankful that you did not require of me that I had to tell everybody everything I've done. But Father... I do thank you that there were times when I did have to tell some people what I did. Had to confess it. Couldn't hide it any longer. And Father, while I am ashamed of some of the things I've done in my life, I'm not ashamed of confessing those things and putting them behind me where they belong, where I want them. So Father, teach us the blessing of confession this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Just a few verses for you. Joshua 7, turn there. Joshua chapter 7. This is the story, of, I mentioned this during Sunday school, this is the story of Achan. When the Israelites were called to go into Jericho after the walls of Jericho fell, God had told Joshua to tell the people, when you go inside Jericho, whatever you see in there, don't touch it. It's not yours. I don't want their trash in amongst my people. Don't take their, don't take their stuff. Don't take their gold. Don't take their idols. Don't look at their books. Don't do anything. Leave, leave it. We're going to burn the whole city down. And then we're going to move on. Don't touch their stuff. Well, there was one man, just one man, Achan, who decided that since nobody around him was looking, that it was okay to go against what God had said because no one around him knew that he did it. No one that knew him knew that he had sinned in this thing. And we know the end result God ended up requiring that sin not only at the hands of Achan, but his wife and his children as well. He had it buried under the tent. And my suspicion is, and the Bible doesn't really say this, so I could be wrong about this, but my suspicion was that his family knew it was there. And they were helping to cover it up so that daddy wouldn't get caught. Meanwhile, the army of Israel got slaughtered at Ai, and thousands of men lost their life in the battle because there was sin in the camp and this man would not willingly come forth and admit that he had done that which God told him not to do and others had to pay the price for it. So Joshua chapter 7 verse 16. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes. The tribe of Judah was taken and he brought the family of Judah and he took the family of the Zarhites. And he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, 
Glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession unto Him. Your confession of your sins will bring glory to God. Whereas your sin brought shame to the name of God, your confession will bring glory to God. Somebody say amen. See, that's, that's how you know your heart is right. It's when you realize that the sins that you commit, why people know you go to church. People know that, well, every Sunday they pull their car out and I see them dressed up and they must be headed to church. Your neighbors know. The people you work with know. People, your family members know. They know you go to church. And then when you go out and you live a life of sin, the people around you know it and you are a laughing stock to them. Yeah, there goes so-and-so. Yeah, I bet he's going to church this morning. I wonder if his church knows where he was last night when he come rolling in about 2.30 in the morning. I wonder if his church knows all the screaming and hollering that goes on in his house over there. I wonder if his church knows that sometimes his empty beer cans fall out of the trash can and I pick them up for it. I guarantee you somebody knows what you really are. You know you're right with God when it bothers you when you sin because you have the possibility of bringing reproach not to your name, you couldn't care less, but to the name of Jesus. No wonder so many people in this country hate God. And they wouldn't give you a dime for a box full of preachers preaching the truth. Because too many church people are dragging the name of God through the mud. With their lifestyle. So Joshua tells Achan, Achan, don't do this for your sake. Don't do it for my sake. Don't do it for the sake of your people. Don't do it for the sake of your family. But Achan, confess your sins for the glory of God. When you hear me pray often, you'll hear me pray, God, for your glory, for your honor, for your kingdom. Do this thing. Do what uplifts and honors you first. Hey, do we not send soldiers out to a dangerous area? And we ask those soldiers, don't defend your life, defend your country. I mean, if you're a soldier and you sign up, you're signing the rights to your life away because in signing that paper and taking that oath, you are swearing to defend the Constitution and the people of the United States of America at all costs. Ron, how many people did you know that never came back from Vietnam? Joe, how many people did you know that never came back from Vietnam? A lot. Those men decided that their own life meant nothing, but the life of their country meant everything. This is why you ought to confess. You ought to think about God first, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. And when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. He hid it not now. He's telling everybody what he did. Now, I'm going to tell you that you ought to thank God. I thank God all the time. We don't have anything in the Bible that tells us that whatever we did this week, before we have church service, you've got to stand up and confess every sin to everybody here in this church. Aren't you glad? Amen. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. This is when Solomon is praying the dedication prayer. Uh, over the house of the Lord. He says in 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 33. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy. Because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee. See we just read that. 
when Israel sins and then they go out to battle and you allow the enemy to prevail against the people of Israel, if they shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. Solomon's prayer was, God, whenever we step out of line, if you'll let us come back to this house and confess what we did, God, that's what we want your house to be. When he said, my house should be called a house of prayer, this, I'm telling you, this house is also a house of confession. Confession. A lot of churches have gotten rid of theirs. We still have ours. Some call them the altar, some call them mourner's benches. But they are a place for you to come down and confess your sins to God. We have no booth in this church where I sit in one area and you sit in another and I pretend I don't know who you are. Amen? I guarantee you that priest knows who you are while you tell me all your dirty, filthy sins. That's, by the way, that's corrupt. And let me tell you something. These priests that went after all these boys, that got started in the confessionals. True story. And then he said in verse 35, when heaven is shut up and there's no rain because they have sinned against thee. You know what rain represents to us? The blessings of God's word. So you sinned, and you've got it on your conscience. And the last thing in the world that you want is to open up God's word and read what you did wrong. And while that sin is still hanging out there and you haven't confessed it, God's shut up the book. And you either A, not reading it, reading it, and ain't getting a thing out of it. That's God shutting up heaven against you. And after a while, you start getting parched. And after a while, you find yourself in famine. What did he tell Amos? Behold, I'll send a famine in the land, but not a famine of water or of bread, but of hearing the words of God. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. Now let me, let me give you a little practical Christianity. Here's what I really believe. I believe God will let you every now and then get into some kind of little sin. There's somebody that I know in this church that they came and said, man, I messed up. And they told me what happened. And they said, I can't, I can't believe I did that. I said, let me tell you why that happened. God allowed that thing to happen to teach you. He's teaching you how to fight. He's teaching you how to do warfare against it. He's teaching you that you're always going to have to rely upon Him always. I said, then you confessed it to God and God, did God forgive it? And he's, yeah, I believe He did. I said, that's exactly right. And I said, next time this same issue comes back around, you know what? You're a little bit more experienced now than you were the last time. And you might know a little bit better about how to fight it off than you did the last time. I said, now you may fall in again, but God will bring you back out. And guess what? Next time you come around, you're a little bit stronger. Next time it comes around, you're a little bit stronger then. And then there'll come a day when you'll say, I don't even worry about that anymore. But it takes 
confession. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, with sackcloths and earth upon them. You know what all that represents? They're humbling themselves and they are abasing themselves before God. You see, what church people like to do, church people like to put on their nice suit, take their Saturday night bath, comb their hair nice, make themselves smell real nice and pretty, come in the house of God and act like everything's okay. But when it's time to confess sins, notice what they did. They fasted. They put on sackcloths. Y'all know what that is, don't you? Them old burlap sacks. How'd you like to wear that for underwear? Uh, uh, uh. Put on sackcloth and they would sprinkle dirt on their head. From dust we came, from dust we will return. And they abased themselves before God. They didn't get cocky with God. They humbled themselves. They lowered themselves down. Verse 2, and the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood. Watch this. If you're going to confess, you better plan on God separating you out from, from the people that you were with when you sinned to begin with. Separated themselves from the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day. And another fourth part they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. This is a formula, by the way. If you're going to fast, right here in Nehemiah, underline this passage here and maybe make a note somewhere in your Bible. If I'm going to fast one day, this is how you do it right here. Fast. Don't eat. Don't eat all day. Humble yourself. Then what you do? Get away from everybody. That means if you're going to spend a day fasting, don't sit and watch Oprah Winfrey all day long on TV. Or who else? Ellen? The View? Days of Our Lives? That's not fasting. If you're going to fast, turn all that junk off, get off Facebook, and fast. Then you separate yourself, and then you confess sins. First thing you do, confess your sins. And then while you're doing it, confess your daddy's sins, and your mama's sins, and all their sins. And then read in the Bible, and then fast some more, and then confess some more, and worship God. That's how you fast. But it's about confessing. Getting it out in the open between you and God so that God doesn't bring it out in the open between you and everybody else. Um, how much more have I got here? I know I'm running out of time. Turn to, um, turn to 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7. I read 1 John 1. We already read that. James 5, confess your faults one to another. Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. We read Romans 10, 9 and 10. We already read that. Psalm 32, I was going to get into, but I'm going to try to move ahead here this morning. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Let me tell you how God works, Okay. Jesus, in the Bible, gave us a formula for how to deal with somebody in the church that has sinned. So let's say that, um, see, John's out in the foyer, so he can't hear me, so I want to talk about John. So let's say that, that I physically saw John or someone saw John do something he shouldn't do. So my responsibility is to go to him privately, privately. Now I want you to hear this, I want you to hear this. Too many people's reputations have been ruined 
because they've confessed sins and moved past them and everybody else run their mouth about them after it was confessed. It's never supposed to be that way. Ever. Here's, but here's the plan. So I go to someone and say, I, I need to ask you a question and it's serious. Did you do this? I'll, I'll give you a real example. I did. I asked somebody that, and they said, yes, I did. I said, thank you for being honest. Now, let's get this thing out before God. Let's confess it and be done with it. So we prayed. And as of right then and there, it's over with. And it's not for public consumption. It doesn't belong with anybody else. It was confessed, repented of, and we moved on. That's the right thing to do. But, if that person doesn't respond then, we can't just let it go. So I'm then required to bring somebody else with me as a second witness. And say, look, we really need to deal with this. We're, listen, we're not trying to embarrass you. We're not trying to out you. We're not, we're not going to post this online. We're doing this in private so that you can be restored. Because I would want to be restored. Wouldn't you? Now, the scripture says, if they confess then, then it's over with. And as far as God is concerned, never to be brought up ever again. Isn't that the right thing? But then, if they won't confess then, I have an obligation to bring it before the whole church. Now, who wants that done? Raise your hand. Number one, I don't want to do it. Number two, I wouldn't want it done on me. But that's the process. Because here's what I'm telling you. Had Achan gone to Joshua before and handed over what he had done, I think God and Joshua would have forgave him right then and there. Achan, you did the right thing. God bless you for it. But that's not what he did. And so what he did had to be brought before the entire congregation of Israel, and it was before the whole congregation of Israel, that he and his family were slaughtered with rocks in front of everybody. Sounds barbaric, sounds brutal, but that's what God said do. Now here's what I'm going to tell you. When you will not repent of your sins, God may send somebody to you that knows what you did. Don't be surprised. And if you won't repent then, don't be surprised if everybody doesn't find out what you did. Don't be surprised. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And those who will not confess their sins, you know what God will do? God will allow that sin in their life to blossom and produce the fruit so that then everybody knows who they are and what they are. Am I right? So 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. Paul said this, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were, it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry 
after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. In other words, God made you sorry, you confessed it, and now you don't have to worry about everybody finding out and it damaging you and the church. So verse 10, he said, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. I may be sorry for what I did, but I'm not sorry that I repented of it. Amen. By the way, it has to be godly sorrow because even your mom and dad knew that you were nine when you said, I'm sorry. So you got a whipping for that one. Verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. Here's what it'll do for you. What carefulness it wrought in you. Number one, confessing sins will bring a care and a concern about your personal life so that you don't want to do this anymore. Number two, what carefulness it wrought in you. Nay, what clearing of yourselves. Now you don't have to worry about the consequences anymore. You confessed it. It's over with. God forgave you. There is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen. Oh, what, a, uh, what carefulness it wrought. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. You know what it does? It makes you mad that the devil talked you into that. And you get mad at the devil and say, I'm sick of the devil. I'm sick of what he's doing in my life. I'm sick of what he's done to my marriage and what he's done to my family. Devil, get out of my life. Amen. Hey, get mad at the devil every now and then. Amen. What indignation. Yay. What fear. What fear? Because you realize just how close you came to being turned over to a reprobate mind by God. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. So Romans 16 says, May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And on one of these days, God's going to lay the devil down and we're going to go. Like ever it was a while ago. I've had it with you. Amen. Sick and tired of the devil. Sick and tired of what he's done. Sick and tired of how he's destroyed our nation. Destroying our families. Destroying our churches. I am tired of it. Yea, in all things I've approved yourself to be clear in this matter. See, it'll put a little zeal in your life and in your heart. And you'll just start hating sin like a Christian is supposed to. And not be a hypocrite. Amen. I better quit. I think I hurt myself. <laughs> Let's bow our heads.